but anyway. All right, so Dr. Chris Lamont here, and this is uh, Wellness Code, and this is a chat. Uh, so Wellness Code is a one-year program, once a month webinar, and, and I have a whole proliferate of people out there all over the place that are part of this wellness code. I do a lecture once a month and they get to view the lecture and then I open up a few chats where they can come online and ask questions if they wish to. Uh, we can do a little review. There are some assignments that go with that. Uh, they have a choice of joining this chat, uh, which is interactive, or they can go ahead and email me questions uh, either one is available uh, to you if you're taking a webinar. So this is a little bit of review on it. The topic in the last webinar was the ethics of food production, nutrition, and chemistry. So in a wellness code, we're not advocating certain foods or food groups. We're looking at the scope of the whole process. I'm a big advocate uh, personally in life because of what I've done in life myself is that I've discontinued reactionary foods. In other words, I started with foods that when I was a little kid, five years old, and I watched people at my table eat them, and it didn't seem to do them any good. It seemed to be flat, right? Uh, kind of like a Thanksgiving dinner. Turkey wasn't, you know, doesn't energize you. I mean, you get done eating, you watch TV. It's like, I'm sorry, it doesn't energize you. So. As I started growing up, I started seeing foods as not energizing, and I discontinue them in my diet for a while to see if it made a difference. I have done that all my life. Every year, I phase a food out. I add a new food that I haven't before eaten. It's, it's getting harder and harder to find foods I haven't eaten after, you know, uh, 70 years of doing this. But it's okay. I still play with that, and I, I do find, as I travel, I find foods that uh, a lot of them we just don't have here. You got to get them canned or shipped in or, or something to have them now. And some foods I discontinue, I put them back in my diet. They work good in my body. I really believe that everybody needs to find some way of doing this for themselves. Uh, I'm advocating a bigger picture is that we have a bigger range, as big a range as we possibly can so that we can make decisions within the range. We're located in the center and we can say, Oh, I like that. I don't like that. I'm in the mood for, right. Uh, I have a lot of recipes I cook. And my wife's a good cook too, really, but I have a lot of recipes I cook. I don't feel comfortable cooking the same recipe more than say two or three times a year. So, uh, and ideally, I would like to cook maybe somewhere between 250 to 300 different foods during the course of a year for a dinner. Uh, so it means that I don't like to repeat things, although I like the recipes, I like to have a lot of diversity. And, uh, and I think that in every aspect of your life, the books I read, things I do, right, there's a lot of diversity. Now, to manage all this diversity, I've had to give up some things. I don't own a television, never have. So I don't watch a TV show, uh, but I read a lot of books. Uh, there's only so much time in your life. So I think you have to prioritize. Uh, and, uh, and, and my wife does a lot of the shopping. She's a really good shopper. Uh, and she buys what's available. And then I search out recipes and diversity from it. And then we get together and we cook and we have fun. Uh, I prefer only to eat one meal a day, and that's kind of what I would do. Uh, I'm not advocating that for you, not at all, but I eat one meal a day. Sometimes my wife will most certainly have breakfast. A lot of times she doesn't do lunch, but she'll do breakfast. Sometimes she'll do a little lunch. So it's not a hard fast rule. Uh, and if we're going somewhere or on a vacation, I might eat more meals. Uh, less so now than what I did when we first were married and traveling. Um, we try to travel to a foreign country a couple of times a year and we try to travel within the United States. Usually if we travel within the United States and has some practical title on it, we go for her business and my business a little bit. We meet people, we talk to people, we, uh, we do whatever it is we do. All right. So the topic that we're really chatting about is the ethics and food when we talk about the ethics in food, mostly in the lecture, I talk food production. I'm saying rather than worry about foods, 
start to look at how it's made. It's all about relationships in your body. It's all about relationships on the planet. It's all about relationships everywhere. So start to look at your food and how's this made? Was there a good relationship between the farmer and their job or the producer and their job? Uh, or is it a chemistry set? Two assignments were presented to you. And one assignment was to play with the concept of balance in your body. Not a very scientific thing. Just start to notice if that food, when you hold it next to you, how you relate to that. Does it give you a sense of balance? And the other thing was to start to record chemistries that you see on the labels. Read labels. Look at chemistries, right? Uh, it's very, very deceptive. Uh, it's even more deceptive when you move away from food and get into cosmetics. Uh, things that we put on our skin, that they're still formaldehyde in a lot of products today. They don't have to put all that stuff on the label. It's not a food. But literally... If there was formaldehyde in your food, remember those pies you used to get that were folded over and they had cherry pies, apple pies, they were kind of all covered with crusty, I don't know, kids ate them. When I was in high school, everybody was always eating those silly things. I didn't particularly like them, but I've eaten a couple of them. Uh, they actually, reading the label, had formaldehyde in them um, because it preserved the food. Uh, it's probably not a good idea to eat formaldehyde. I'm not sure that it's really healthy for you. Uh, but if you eat formaldehyde, your liver gets to address it. But if you put a chemical on your body that has formaldehyde in it, because it's trying to preserve oils that would be good for your skin, but the formaldehyde then doesn't go through your liver. It goes immediately into your blood. So you really got to start to look at, do some searching, See if you can find what's going on. Um, someone's coming on with a chat I see on there, but I'm not all that sure how to work chat. So whoever's out there, hi. Uh, and uh, uh, I will be open to questions a little later on. I just want to toss a few things out. So I'm just saying that when I talked about the ethics, I'm looking at the ethics in a relationship it's not just the ethics in producing, it's much, much bigger than that. It's how we look with it, how we play with it. I'm gonna give you four or five really quick references and then I'll throw this out to question. Uh, and so the first book I'm gonna talk about, because obviously I live in a world of books, right? So the first book I'm gonna talk about is, is a book, and he's written several books. It's called Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. The only thing I mention, I'm not, I'm not recommending that you run out and buy the book, right? If you want to read it, read it if you want to. But he's written several books. Uh, this guy is a doctor. He works in brain science. He's in Southern California. Uh, the last I understand, initial consultation with him is four grand. Uh, so it's not exactly a very inexpensive experience to engage in, right? Uh, if you had a lot of brain damage, it would be a good way to go. What he's been able to accomplish, which is why I'm showing it to you, is that he's been able to cure brain disease and heal brains using diet and exercise and, of course, a little bit of medical therapy. Uh, this is like a first. He's opened a doorway to do some amazing stuff. You are part of Wellness Code, and we're going to, in a couple of months, by December, we're going to be starting to look at wellness code. And what I'm doing, I'm giving you some of the parameters going into the front door that we're going to be shuffling around. I want you to notice an ethic, an ethic that sits there is that we can fix things that used to think, we used to think weren't fixable. We can fix them with diet and exercise and a little bit of care, right? It's amazing. So, uh, Good book, a, a lot about the character. He is an amazing individual. Most certainly, a uh, different approach, different way to go. But uh, just the big note is that you can fix even brain disease, the first thing. Uh, the second book is called The Dental Diet. Uh, this guy has got a couple of books out. This one here is readable. The other one is a little heavy. <laughs> it's kind of like the the more uh, research side of this book, this is a, a more friendly approach. I'm not advocating that you run out and jump on his diet. His diet 
nothing wrong with his diet yet, but most certainly it's kind of like the catch all of where we're at in diets right now today, eat more fat, blah, blah, blah. If you're still eating artificial sweeteners and uh, low fat foods, it's a little scary. Uh, we kind of got over that, but anyway, uh, things have changed a lot. You can look all those ideas up. Then the thing I like about this book is because he's a dentist, he's coming at it from the standpoint of dentistry. And he gets into, because he found that being a dentist and working with people's teeth, he really had to get into talking about diet with them. I'll give you one small detail. This is a very readable book. If you're going to go buy one and read it, this is a fun one to read. It's well-written. It's a good book. Uh, in indigenous tribal people around the world, today, today even, indigenous tribal people reading indigenous, eating indigenous food that they've been on for traditional food for them, they have stronger teeth, they have straight teeth, less than 3% cavity. Pretty much all of the civilized world that, and especially American, American diets, we have, we're born with crooked teeth. We have high rates of cavity. Uh, so it starts to tell you that he's saying it's because of the food we eat. We shouldn't need all this dental work. And it's because of the fact that we don't chew enough. We're eating the wrong kinds of foods. Uh, for example, the bacteria in your body, right? I've told you bacteria in your body is 60%, right? Uh, and your gut alone is 50% of the mass. In other words, for every human cell you have, you have one cell of bacteria. Now it's much smaller, so it doesn't take up as much real estate, but it's all in your gut. Uh, all that bacteria lives on sugar for the most part. Uh, but one thing that he was really interested in is like just in your mouth alone, uh, the bacteria in your body every day about 10% of it goes out in waste, dies off and goes out in waste. Yes, it's colonizing and it's living in your gut, but you have to feed more bacteria into it. So you start to see that literally, do you not only eat food, you're also eating bacteria. So that's why it's important to have organic food. It's important to have things that aren't filled with chemicals and sterilized, because if you're not getting bacteria, you're not going to live. It, actually breaks our food down. Now in your mouth, you could eat refined processed sugars and a bacteria that lives on those sugars will grow in quantity in your mouth and become part of your body. It will go do that. If you chew foods that have sugar in them, like even sugar cane is fibrous. When you chew foods like apples, pears, it has sugar in it. That's a different type of bacteria that gets sugar out of fiber than the type of bacteria that just lives on available sugar. The bacteria we want in our body, because we're using it to break food down, is a bacteria that breaks food down to get its sugar, not one that just wants to live on free sugar, right? So therefore, if we chew foods, apples, anything that we chew, and we extract sugar from within that, the bacteria that thrives and becomes part of our biome will come from a fiber base, which is far more effective working with us. He has lots of great exercises, lots of great ideas. Once again, uh, I'm not sure if I'd run out and change my whole diet to what he's saying. My diet is very similar. Uh, I think that's enough said. There's some other variables in there you can ask questions about if you want to, but there'd be a good book to read. The Dental Diet, very fun book. Uh, here's, here's one of, I think, four or five books by Raymond Francis. This is called The Great American Health Hoax. Uh, Raymond Francis is an interesting character. Uh, he got sick somewhere in his 40s. Uh, and he had some cancer. He got well. He did a lot of research. He's kind of like a, a little bit of perfectionist. He gets into things he digs. He's gone through and everything that you can imagine, 
about research and data. He's dug into the white papers. He's written this all up into a series of books. And he's saying, take a look at the research. Some research is really good, and some research is supported by food companies, and the research is a little tainted in that direction. For example, one researcher, I'm not going to give you his name, but one researcher did a lot of research and favored who was paying his check, right, to do the research. Uh, and so he augmented the research to kind of cater to his payroll uh, and lost all credibility. And so he had to quit doing research. And he's the guy that put together the government's pyramid diet. Isn't that interesting? Uh, a little piece of trivia. Anyway, uh, not, not a book that reads easy. He's got five books. Uh, I think they probably all say the same thing with some variation from it. I enjoyed reading it, but it's a little depressing. By the time you're done, you think, oh, my God, what can I really eat? He reveals a huge amount of data. Of, if, you're, if you get depressed easily or you don't want to look at all the data, then I wouldn't read this. But anyway, it's a resource. Raymond Francis, he's got YouTube videos. You can listen to him talk. Uh, and uh, and does, he has a whole series of books out there. I enjoyed it. But, you know, uh, because I like to read white papers and I like to get data. Uh, research is getting much better today, really much, much better. They're, they're really getting sharper. When you go back, let, let's go back a long ways. When they were doing the research where they said, oh my goodness, high fat diets are really bad for you, way back when. Uh, and they did it with mice. Uh, I dug up white papers and I started looking at what they were feeding the mice. So was it a high fat diet? Yes, it was a high fat diet. They had put together a food for these mice that was 60% lard. Now that's pretty much a high fat diet, uh, right? 20% of that was sucrose and 20% of that was dairy protein. So did they gain weight? Yes, they gained weight. They made it look like they gained weight because they were on a high fat diet. Uh, there's an interesting thing because fat has twice the calories of a carbohydrate. So if you eat an ounce of fat or an ounce of carbohydrates, the ounce of fat will give you twice the carbohydrates. Now calories in calories out is not necessarily true, but part of that story is that, excessive amount of calories will put weight on. If you eat four or 5,000 calories a day, at some point very quickly, you're gonna to start to gain weight, I'll guarantee you. But if, as long as you're somewhere within a healthy range, a couple of thousand, 2,000 to under 3,000 calories a day, you can start to balance, it depends on your exercise, how hard you work, so on and so forth, you can start to balance some of those out. So when we start to compare some of those, when they start to compare, amount of food eating, some of those low carb uh, diets that they put out there really had more than normal amounts that they didn't necessarily have larger amounts of fat. They were just a normal piece of fat. So when you start to look at the details of the diets, especially the older research, there was really pretty slanted. I'm not trying to say that the researchers were bad. I'm just trying to say that they didn't think about all the details very clear. Today, there's a lot more that goes into them. So the research that's coming out today is a lot more beneficial. So this is Raymond Francis. He's got a bunch of books out there. They're paperback. They're very inexpensive. If you wanted to know all the stuff that you can know about white flour and blah, 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 everybody is saying the same thing today. It's like, let's get away from sugar. When I say sugar, I'm talking about refined sugar, right? If you're growing sugar beets in your backyard and you're extracting that from the pulp, probably a much healthier source of sugar than a refined sugar, right? Uh, hydronated flour and hydronated oils. That's just taking liquid oil and making it solid, right? Or breaking the flour down, taking all the food value in and just putting a scant amount back in again. <laughs> those become a huge problem in our diet. So 
pretty much everybody is saying the same thing. Get away from white sugar, get away from white flour if you can. Uh, when I say get away from it, I mean, once again, I started out saying that I would take out sugar, I would take out flour, I would take out peanuts, uh, of course, gluten would be out of my diet. I would take all those out of my diet for 30 days. Dairy would be out of my diet. No cheeses, no dairy for 30 days. And then I would very slowly introduce one item, like maybe cheese back into my diet for 30 days. Keep everything out of it and see how I feel. If I feel fine eating cheese for 30 days, then I'd start to put maybe a little milk back into my diet. From doing just that, I find that I can eat cheese. It's not the case, it's, it's the lactose. So I'm lactose intolerant. I can actually handle a little milk in my coffee, but not every day. Uh, I, I have, right now I've cut back on coffee. I kind of go in cycles, more coffee, less coffee, right? I don't have a problem with it. I just try to not be excessive in anything, but there for a while, I was having five, six cups of coffee a day. So to drink that much coffee, even with a tablespoon of milk, that's five or six tablespoons of milk a day. In about two or three days, my stomach would start to get topsy-turvy from all that dairy. So I used goat's milk, right? Uh, so now I cut back on the goat's milk because I cut back on the coffee. I'm drink, drinking tea right now. It's an herbal tea. Uh, I prefer a warm beverage to a hot to a cold beverage. So I'm usually drinking warm beverages. So it's either going to be an herbal tea or a coffee. That's kind of where I bounce between the two. Uh, uh, just it's the habit of living, right? The habit of, and I make changes in those habits all the time just to play it out. So anyway, Raymond Francis's book, another little piece of information. I don't have a book from him. There's a guy in, um, Australia in uh, 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 that is a, uh, a researcher. He's a naturopathic doctor in Australia. Uh, he got his degree in naturopathic medicine and then he went into research and into clinical setting, working with the microbiome. He's been doing that for a little over 18 years now. So that means that he worked for a clinic in, in Tasmania uh, and his name is Dr. Jason uh, Horalek, that's H-A-W-R-E-L-A-K. You can look him up on YouTube videos. Uh, I've listened to several of his talks. I really have no idea what he's talking about. I mean, he's talking about all the gut biome and he rattles off all the names and that's all really Greek to me, to tell you the truth. Uh, the main reason I'm bringing this up that I'm mentioning it to you is that he's saying that in his clinic, when we get sick and we take medication for the sickness, we really wipe out the population of gut bacteria. Occasionally, we wipe out a bacteria completely. We lose it completely. That was part of our regimen before. And then supposedly, it never, never comes back. Also, research, if you look at the latest scientific research, is that when we take those, those probiotics, they don't stay in our body for more than around four or five days, and they're all gone. It looks like a waste of money. This guy has done 18 years of clinical research working with microbiomes. What he's saying is that it takes a long time, but he's had success, it takes about a year, by using probiotics and slowly but surely giving them to you every day and every day and every day. He can start to, takes about a year, but he can start to recolonize some of the biome that has been lost because of medications that we've taken and bring it back in to get us back into a normal state of health. So it's also possible, once again, like the brain chemistry, it's also possible to get us back into a nice balanced piece of health. It takes it takes after you've gone through medication because you've got an infection, you got sick, stuff happens, right? So pretty much, or chemo, those type of drugs pretty much wipe out everything. 
You can recolonize that. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. So if you get a bottle of probiotics and you think that's going to solve it for you, it's not necessarily true. You might have to do those probiotics every day, every day, every day, every day for six months to a year before you start to get some of that good bacteria colonized back in there. But it does happen. And that was kind of a nice piece of research. I haven't seen anything yet written by him except for a few papers that he's worked on. Uh, so it'll be interesting. He's supposedly working on a book. We'll see. Uh, his papers are a little hard for me to understand because I think you'd have to be in the field. Uh, all those, you know, there's, there's over a thousand bacteria in your gut. They all have these Latin names. And then there's a diversity. When I say a, a, a diversity, um, let me explain for a second before I go into the last one. The diversity comes from the fact that uh, um, think of typhoid Mary. Uh, some of you may have heard this story, right? Uh, there was a lady that came from Europe to the United States and she didn't have an education. She got a job here in the United States. She became a cook for a family. Uh, everybody in the family, or most everybody, including Mary, got typhoid. Um, they couldn't figure out, because there was no typhoid in America, they couldn't figure out where it came from. Uh, there was some in Europe and none in America. So there was a researcher then, way back then, that took in actually uh, stool samples from all these people and searched the stool samples after they had recovered, because there was no cure then for typhoid. And they found that even though everybody had got about with typhoid and nobody in this family died, but they had recovered, they went through the stool samples and, and only Mary had still typhoid bacteria in her stool, no one else did. So they quarantined Mary for two years watching her and she still had typhoid in her gut. No one else did. So after two years of quarantine, they told her, you can go out of the hospital. She was a prisoner for two years. You can leave the hospital. You just can't be a cook. All right? So she goes out, and the only thing she knows for a job is a cook. So she changed her name. She got a job cooking at a, for a family and literally gave them all typhoid. Uh, so they figured out that that was the same Mary. They threw her back into quarantine in prison until she died. 23 years she was incarcerated as quarantine. So she was called Typhoid Mary. They, of course, she wasn't the only one that brought typhoid to America. Typhoid broke out in lots of things totally unassociated with Mary. It's just very sad that she got punished as a result of it. Now, what happened in America is that our bacteria in our gut started to get stronger and started to find a way to balance the uh, with the typhoid experience so these people that got it they didn't become immune to typhoid their gut bacteria became immune to typhoid it couldn't get in their cut gut and take over and kill the other bacteria it couldn't colonize so our bacteria became a different strain of it so literally do we not only have a thousand different bacteria in there but we have a huge diversity of strains of those bacteria, which then all have a different letter or a number or something by them as a, or an, yeah, number. It's really huge, amazing uh, piece of data out there that gets involved in all this. It's really very complicated, which brings me to the personal diet. Last book I'm going to talk about, and then I'll throw this open for questions. The personal diet is a book. I sent you a link to the YouTube video where you had uh, Aaron Siegel speaking a little bit about this. I think that the future will be that we'll analyze the biome in our gut and we'll be able to tailor make a diet for everybody on the planet. I'm, I have been working all my life to tailor make a diet for Chris. I'm advocating that all you guys go out and find out what works for you and tailor make a diet for you. Uh, it's trial and error. So you have to give up foods, wait a little while, balance it out, put foods back in. It 
It's taken me seven years to get where I'm at and I'm still working on it, right? To go take a test for a couple hundred dollars would be much better and have them hand you a diet. This is still a beta program. So people had emailed me and said, should I do this, Chris? I, this is based, basically, the criterion they made was for sugar. All these people involved in this were borderline diabetics, which seems to be our entryway choice of ill health is to move in the direction of borderline diabetic. Not that for, a, for everybody, but most certainly that way for the mass of us. So once again, it's a piece of research. It took the doorway that most people go down into getting sick by all of a sudden having their sugars go south on us because we eat way too much sugar. And then from there become sick with whatever, cancers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So they used it as a doorway to do their research. So that's the focus on it. Uh, if you're borderline, I am uh, occasionally borderline diabetic. My sugars come in at about 97, 98, sometimes 100, 101 when I have a blood test. So I'm pre-diabetic just because the numbers go up above 100 occasionally, right? So I could actually benefit from this right now. I think this is going to improve. It's going to be worth more next year. So uh, if you're not pre-diabetic, I, I wouldn't go spend money on this diet. But I'm going to pursue it a little more, right? So I would advocate that you get the book. This is a good book to read. It reads well. It's a fun book to read. It kind of throws out a lot of myths. It gives you the latest idea and research. And this is good research. And he'll critique research that was a little shabby. And, and so it's fun to give you an in-depth view, an easy to read in-depth view of where some of the research has gone south, some of the research wasn't all that warranted, and how we got lost and how uh, a piece of research that wasn't quite secured became popular and people jumped on it and reacted to it. A, react, a reaction is not a decision, right? It's just a reaction. It's probably not the wisest thing we do. I mean, when someone throws at something at you and says, duck, it's probably a good idea to react, right? Uh, but for the most part, when it comes to eating and change your lifestyle over something, that's a reaction. It's probably not wise probably nice to have more data in. This will start to give you some more data. A strong ethic in here, that's what I'm getting to. So there's, of, of all those books I've thrown out, this is the one I would recommend if you're a reader. If you're not a reader and you're not pre-diabetic, don't sweat the small stuff. Most certainly play with food. Going in the front door of Wellness Code, before you learn the technology of Wellness Code, which is going to be starting up in December, we'll start to get into the technique. You really need to be able to do the background and be able to make some changes, okay? And so we'll talk about that a little more next month's lecture for November and, and gear up for the December piece, okay? So I'm going to throw this open for questions. By now, we should have five participants in there. Anybody out there, go ahead and unmute. And go ahead, if you've got a question for me, shoot it out there. I see people in chat. I'm, I'm not too sure how to use chat. Uh, so just unmute your mic and ask me a question. Um, All right. I got a question. It's not okay. really a question. It's just a comment. It's just to add a little bit more here. To okay. And one of the things that you, you might get a little closer to your mic. You're not coming through very loud. Okay. How about that? It's better. Better? Okay. One of the things you've mentioned is ingredients in food, and I totally agree food should have ingredients, but not too many. And what I find is, is that uh, it's really simple. I read ingredients religiously. Right. And I find it's really simple that if you've got two or three inches of, of ingredients for something very simple, uh, I wouldn't even bother reading them just to throw them out. Right. But uh, one of the things that I really wanted to mention is water. Yes. Because uh, the, our water supply has been uh, extremely uh, uh, 
contaminated uh, by fracking operations, for example, and also just, uh, uh, you know, from the drought that there's been in here in California, where uh, so much of the aquifers were pumped out and then uh, excess water, which has pesticides and all that other stuff, get pumped back in. So in terms of wellness, I, I think that it, it's almost um, essential uh, to have a, a high quality water filter in your home. I, I know where you're at now, you don't uh, feel you have that exposure. Um, but, um, you know, the city of San Diego is very happy to send us these uh, envelopes every year that says everything's perfect. Don't pay attention. Don't look here. Look there. And... Um, so that's really all I wanted to say is that uh, the water is a very, very uh, uh, essential part of this whole thing. I, and it's a good point. N number one and the most essential thing and the nutrient that you have to have all the time is air. And so the first thing that you get to look at is air. Then after that, you can make it a day or so without water. Uh, so water is the next most important thing that you start to look at. Uh, but changing the air that you breathe and changing the water that you drink is not as easy as changing the food. So part of where I'm staging this, and it's a good question, Michael, uh, I moved to get to better water and I moved to get to better air. Uh, I have been in Southern California during the fires and I was pretty much my wife and I were, I was sick for a month and she was sick for two months just from the fires. I travel to two foreign countries a year, uh, not countries that anybody should ever go to like India. I mean, nobody in our right mind should go to India. I'm not all that sure that Peru was that healthy of a place. Ecuador was much better. Uh, I've been exposed to all kinds of stuff. Uh, in air and in water. Uh, my next trip is to uh, next year. I'm looking at Morocco, and they say that in Morocco, if you wash your hands with water, you need to wash it again afterwards with alcohol because the water is so bad that you don't want the bacteria on your hands. And your clothing, etc., really need to be uh, dipped in boiling water uh, and then sprayed with some alcohol disinfectant before you put clothes on that have been washed. Uh, so there's a huge amount of bacteria that we're going to be taking a look at as we move into uh, my, my next adventure. Uh, so typically the yes. uh, um, alcohol, Purell, whatever you put on your hands doesn't work if your hands are dirty. They, you, you absolutely have to wash your hands first and right. then use Sanitizer. And then you have to use the alcohol. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And that's what it said. After you wash your hands, you put alcohol on. And the same after you wash your clothes, dip them in boiling water. Then most certainly you got to spray them with a little something to kill some of the resident bacteria that can harbor on there. So you don't wind up getting it through your skin. Uh, uh, and I don't know how that's all going to play out or how serious we're going to be about all the, all the above. Uh, well, if I didn't point about the water, it's that that water is what all the organic food that we're supposedly be helping ourselves out by eating is grown with. So uh, there's not quite the saving grace of eating organic that we thought there were so that the uh, quality of the water that we consume and that we wash ourselves with other than that is extremely important. Yes, and the quality of the water that we put on those plants and if so organic bottom line in America organic in America means that the soil has been treated they basically burn what's there they don't plant anything for three years the soil is treated and cultivated so that there's organic matter in the soil uh, yes the water is put onto that most certainly it comes into play uh, I'm not sure that we're going to be eating food grown with that water in Morocco we'll have to see how that comes in. A lot of the food that I was exposed to in restaurants in Peru was food that got imported in, came from other places. 
Uh, and I think that we're going to see a lot of that in hotels and places, restaurants and stuff. Uh, but not in India. The food in India was all local, right? Uh, we have, uh, and the bacteria level most certainly was high. Also, the the dishes and the plates and everything that you used in India were washed in cold water, not hot water. Uh, they washed it with soap, and then they just wiped it off for the rag, and that was all the plates. So um, there wasn't uh, there wasn't an exposure of hot water to kill bacteria. So I don't know what will wind it into Morocco. Uh, it'll be an experience for the most part. We'll see if we survive it or not. Uh, but the day-to-day -day living, n number one is that uh, I think I mentioned uh, last year or so we were living here in Vancouver in Washington State, and we had fires that were in Idaho and Canada and in Oregon, and it got really smoky here. And so I packed up our stuff and went to the mountains and camped out for a few days to get into some fresh air. Uh, I can actually access that, move around up here and be somewhat local and get out of the air and get into some fresh air. Part of why I moved up here, I, some of you guys live wherever you live, you work wherever you live, you can only do so much, right? Because I understand that's all part of nature. Uh, when it comes to filtration systems, if you use a reverse osmosis that at least will take the fluoride out of your water, you need to have four filters plus the screen for reverse osmosis. That particular system for every gallon of water that you're consuming, you're wasting two gallons. So your water bill is going to triple if you're running all your water through reverse osmosis. And the filters pretty much are going to be twice a year. So not only does that system cost anywhere from $1,000 to $4,000 to install, uh, the filters are going to cost you several hundred dollars a year too. So it has to be within a doable means. It's kind of like, can you afford, uh, can you afford that system? Uh, when it just comes to sticking a little tiny filter uh, on your faucet and filtering stuff out, uh, I think that you have to look at those carbon uh, filters that they put on there and feel that they, they drop in effectiveness every day. And you look at the research, the research shows them when they're brand new. If you look at one that's already been two weeks old, you find that it's about half as effective. And by the time you've had it a month, and so those filters you're paying $25 or $30 for, you can easily go through two a month if you're trying to keep a standard. And a lot of them doesn't, don't really filter out the really fine stuff, like the fluorides and stuff that they put in the water. So it depends on the size of the molecules. So literally, in a reverse osmosis system, they have to have four filters to filter out the large chunks so that doesn't get into the screening that they then filter out the small stuff. And it's a back flush on the screening to keep it from plugging up all the time, which is why it wastes so much water. Uh, none of that is real practical financially unless you've got enough money to pay for that whole system. Uh, so that's why I keep the context as like, we do what we can. We most certainly can make some changes on food there are some people in America that have very little choice on food, right? Uh, my son, when he moved to St. Louis, Missouri, of all places in a farm country, you would have thought the food was really good quality. But he said in the wintertime, the food was really, really shabby. And a lot of it, because there was no growing in the winter, it get cold there, right? So it was all imported in and very, very old. Things that are grown in Colombia and are shipped in, yes, they come in air freight, but they still are a week to two weeks old when you get them in your store. Um, the other thing, too, is that things that are grown in hot houses don't have the same nutriment level. Uh, the soil is reused many, many times. It's quite depleted. Uh, so uh, eating food that's in season, that's locally grown, has variety, diversity in your diet would be an ideal solution. Uh, you take whatever steps you can as you start to move into it. So I'm advocating the first step is to look at the ethics, the ethics in food production, the ethics in availability, the ethics in testing, 
Uh, when you look at organic international food, the soil, uh, they can actually in China take a place that's an old nuclear plant and they can bulldoze that down and just plant organic food tomorrow and start to grow that. And it would be organic food grown organically, but the soil wasn't really necessarily treated. So our standard of what's organic is a little different than some of the international standards. What we get is going to be a little bit better. Uh, I just, my wife just informed me that she saw a little piece of literature. I haven't found the data, the data on it yet to really quote you back on it. But a lot of the drug companies have been buying up vitamin companies because they want to be part of the profit scheme that goes with vitamin companies too. They don't want to miss out on that. They were trying to make vitamins illegal like they did in Europe. If you want to buy a vitamin in Europe, you have to get a prescription from a doctor. Not so in America. We've been able to keep that out of America so we can buy supplements. <clears throat> so according to at least the piece of data that she got was that some of these drug companies are putting in some chemicals, uh, some of the pharmaceutical items into their vitamins to, to give them a little zip to help market them. So Prozac was one of the things they found traces of in some of the vitamin supplements, supposedly. I haven't read the paper yet. So right now it's just a hype. It's a piece that's been put out there. I don't know if it's true or legitimate, but <clears throat> but it would make total sense that they'd be able to trying to get some favoritism for their brand of vitamins and supplements over someone else's, right? So we're always dealing with a, in a no truth world, we're always dealing with the credibility of something. Uh, I, we have to look better research. We really need to, when we find something, we have to follow it. We have to see where it came from. Did it come from a reliable source or did someone just make it up? Uh, we're seeing more and more stuff just being fed to us, made up to create chaos in America, right? We've seen more and more that come down the pike where we're trying to uh, challenge, uh, we're, we're moving into uh, what they call that safetyism right now. We're starting to find uh, ghosts in the closet, so to speak. We're, we're trying to find that uh, we're feeding all this paranoia that's starting to come up and we find that uh, they're trying to throw a, somebody supposedly is trying to throw some uh, imbalance into America and start to light up those pieces of, of uh, what to trust and what not to trust. So I, I'm just a big advocate. If you have the time to check the research out to see where it comes from, most certainly look these things up. Uh, a lot of them are put out today. They don't, uh, they're given credit back to some research centers. And in the research centers, when you go to their site, they say, we never did that research. We had no affiliation from it. Someone just lied. So you really have to look all this stuff up. And I know it's kind of a pain, right? Uh, I try to put things out that has some credibility. I most certainly looked them up. Uh, I have found uh, a, a lot of really bad research, uh, small tests, 40, 50 people, 20 people. They got results out of 20 people. What a joke. And they're all in the same area. Yeah, there's not much diversity, right? Uh, and sometimes we're finding diversity uh, in some of the strangest places. Uh, I don't know if you guys caught it, but uh, uh, when we look at samples in a legal business, when we look at samples of DNA, to take someone, we have to have a sample. In other words, if we have a, an event, uh, a blood sample at a murder or a rape uh, some, somewhere, we can get a DNA sample. We check our database for criminals to see if that matched up. If we don't have a DNA on file somewhere, then pretty much it's an unsolved case until something shows up. But I just read today that they've been using a total different database Someone developed a database, I believe it's a guy out of Florida a long time ago, developed a database that really was looking at a wide vision for data so that you could look at where your genetic structure comes from. So it's kind of like an online thing where you could see kind of where the pools and deposits that seem to follow patterns, right? 
all the German people in America has some similar properties in DNA because they came out of a certain genetic pool, right? So that's been useful in starting to find out where your heritage is. I, I, I'm not all that sure that you're going to be able to identify the actual person, but you can identify the pool. So criminologists have been using these databases to find a pool for that, to find where, and they've been able to solve a lot of cases because once they find a pool and they start to then check characters living in a certain area, and maybe in Utah, maybe from a German heritage or Dutch heritage or Spanish heritage, and they start to look at people that were suspects or could meet some of the criterion, they could then target it down. They just found another person who had committed several crimes. They had DNA samples. They were able to screen it down. They were able to make a case of probability, a probable cause that he at least followed the MO. They were able to bring someone in that gave them a warrant to get a DNA sample. They actually then could match it up with the DNA they had from the crime scene, and they were able to actually convict someone. So all of this stuff from better science is coming into play and making uh, us not really a more unsafe world, but actually a far more safe world. Crime is down, way down from the 70s and 80s. Things are starting to change. We're actually getting better research. We're getting better technology in. Uh, when you go on the internet, you're seeing more and more variables thrown out. It looks like uh, we're in a state of chaos, but we're really not in a state of chaos. We're re-looking at things, and we're coming back with better answers. We're coming back with better research on it, where a, a lot of that research is getting published. So you see things that seem like they've gone in change in direction. They have. Better research has given us better answers. We now have more technology available to us and all that's playing into it. Is it complex? Yes, it's extremely complex and you've got to kind of pick your battles. So uh, to answer Michael, yes. I don't talk a whole lot about the air quality. I'm sorry if you live in LA, you should realize the air quality is not good in LA. There are other places that have very poor air quality. Most certainly you can look that up online, search air quality and see what it tells you. Water quality, something else you can search. Do we have the best water quality in Washington State? No, not the best. We're in the second tier. There are places with better water quality naturally. They have less population, less resources available. I took a better quality than what I was getting in California in making the move here. Most certainly it was an improvement, not the best, but an improvement. Uh, most certainly better. Do we have a little bit of fluoride in our water? Yes. Do I take supplements trying to balance it out? Yes, I most certainly do. Uh, should I put a filtration system in it? Literally, I can't afford it. It's way too expensive and I can't justify it. Uh, I can do the supplements cheaper than I can do the filtration system. And I'm not willing to waste that much water. That's kind of where I sit. I, I'm waiting for more research to come out and being able to produce, produce a better filtration system. And so far, I haven't seen anything new yet that's quite meets that criterion, but I'm still looking. There's some very promising things coming up in the market. So pretty much we're dealing with food, right? Uh, part of why I live here is I can get organic food that's grown right down the street. There are farms around here, they're small, very organic. Is there enough organic food to feed everybody on the planet? In the United States, we figured we could feed one and one to one and a half percent. I think since those statistics came out in 2000, we've increased organic food production, most certainly. Farmers want to sell their food, they pay attention to market, they're in business. So you see all that coming into play. Uh, I think most certainly there's a change uh, I have seen corporate restaurant food drop in quality, but I've mostly seen independent restaurant people improve in quality. Uh, I'm not intimidated by going out to a local restaurant, uh, local family owned restaurant in the area and find really good, really fresh quality food. And I'm delighted to see that. Um, 
But since I do travel and every now and then it's late at night and you wind up in a corporate place, I'd have to say that my experience personally has been in the corporate places, the food quality has been dropping. And I think that's very sad. Uh, they have availability out there, but the, the food quality is not there. So if you had different experience, speak up. What do we got out there? This is all the ethics, right? What I'm talking about those ethical pieces, right? And I'm not rattling off the name of any particular restaurant chain. I'm just, uh, I went to a restaurant, I won't give you the name, but I went to a restaurant in Chico visiting some friends. We went out to eat because it was late when we got there. Uh, and I had been to a, a commercial corporate restaurant probably a year. Uh, I was in a state of shock when I ordered a sandwich to the breadway, ate the meat, and it, it came with fries. I ate a few of the fries. Uh, their special recipe was they put sugar on the fries and then deep fry them so it browns them up on the outside. They looked nice and crispy on the outside, but you bite into one of those fries. Oh my gosh, it was like eating a piece of cheesecake. It was so sweet, it was unbelievable. Uh, a couple of, I saw a couple of reviews online where some of the restaurants, Italian restaurants, roll their meatballs in sugar and then fry them. So they get crispy on the outside uh, and very sweet tasting. They claim people love them. But once again, it gets us back to sugar. And nowhere on the menu does it say meatballs here are rolled in sugar. Uh, if it had not been from a couple of people who went there and said, I took a meatball home with me and tested it. Most certainly I had it tested and it had, I don't know, I know there's places you can go to have things tested, but that costs you money, right? I don't know. I never thought of taking a slice of lunch meat home and run it down and have it tested somewhere, but I know people do that. So whatever. I'm just advocating that we look at the ethics involved. We start to take a look at what reviews we see out there. Uh, we don't get all tied up and in, in go into reaction to those. We start to make evaluations for ourselves and see if we can improve that quality because we're moving in the direction of having a better relationship with what we eat. Yes, I'd like to have a better relationship with the air we breathe. I'm not willing to move to Virginia, coal mining country. No, I don't think so. Uh, been to coal mines coming across the United States in 94. A couple of towns I pulled into that said, you know, open air coal mines. I pulled in to take a look at them, got out of the car, took a deep breath and go, oh my goodness gracious. Oh, I could feel that in my lungs. Now, maybe I was just crazy, but like, wow. Got back in the car and said, I was going to go take a tour that they were offering and I, and see their museum. And instead I just decided to drive to the next town. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you got to kind of evaluate for yourself, right? This is kind of what exposure is, right? Now, I did survive six weeks in India. You know, I was probably pretty challenged for about three, four months to get my microbiome back into some semblance of balance. And, and I'm not all that sure that, uh, that uh, I don't know. I don't know what, what the cost is. Uh, to that aspect of the body, but well, certainly I'm digging in and researching that and starting to see. I think that we need to relate to people in the world. I think that we need to open that doorway. Uh, why should I not go to India? Because people from India are coming here. They're sitting next to me in a restaurant. They're driving on a bus. They're in my city. They're people that I see on the street. I don't have a problem with them. So we're interacting anyway. So why should I run from that? Why should I be intimidated? We have to learn to get along. And I think that's the big picture. So I went to India for six weeks, exposed myself to all the above, and here I am part of the world, right? I think that's what we need to do, right? If you're already sick, that's another thing of being cautious, right? I changed my diet on purpose. 
I geared up for the experience. I'm going to be gearing up from my experience to Morocco, guarantee you, come the first of the year. Um, and I'm going to venture into it and see what happens. So um, any other questions out there? This uh, ethics of food, which is much bigger than just production of food. Well, that's the heart of it. But most certainly the relationship, the testing of it, the advertisement of foods, uh, being able to give you a fair description, being truthful in that element. What have you discovered for yourself? Um, we had some people over one night and I ran to the store to get some Brussels sprouts, um, making Brussels sprouts for dinner. I went down to the local market where I normally get Brussels sprouts. I had a small bag of organic Brussels sprouts at home. I went over there to get some more because I had a few people coming. I wanted to have more available. Uh, they didn't have any organic Brussels sprouts. I just thought, ah, what the heck. I just got an, a bag of Brussels sprouts, non-organic. First time in my life I ever noticed a difference, truthfully. I came home, I cleaned up all those Brussels sprouts, mixed them all together, steamed them all up, put them in a pan, fried them with butter and blah, blah, blah. Fixed this dish out and put it on the table and I'm sitting there eating these Brussels sprouts it, and I could taste most certainly a chemical taste in those Brussels sprouts and I would pick through them and eat one go okay I don't taste a chemical in that one and then I'd pick another one now I don't taste it there I may maybe I imagine it and then I pick the third one oh I could actually taste the difference. Crazy it seems, it's like Brussels sprouts. Wow. Uh, anyway, uh, I have no idea what that spray was, but you could taste it. It was most certainly in the taste. Uh, so it made me push back in the direction of more organic. Uh, I, don't, I don't like that metallic aftertaste that I got. I'm just assuming that's some type of a bug spray or a chemical fertilizer or something. I have no way of knowing. I should have saved one of those Brussels sprouts and probably paid a couple hundred dollars to someone test it, but I didn't do that. I just go, okay, I can notice the difference. So <laughs> changing and moving in the direction of more organic food, I did just because I felt the bacteria would be far more friendlier than my gut. That was my only, I didn't actually taste the difference before. And now I have sampled several between the two. I have gone back and forth. Asparagus, nah, it's not a big deal to me. I don't taste the difference between organic and inorganic asparagus. I really don't. I have had both. I can't tell the difference in taste. Uh, cauliflower, I've noticed the difference in taste. Brussels sprouts, I told you I would notice a difference in taste. Uh, lettuce, I don't taste the difference. I, I really don't. Uh, I, I buy organic lettuce now and then. There's no organic lettuce or it looks really horrible. I, I'll get something else, but I buy organic once again because I think it's friendlier bacteria. It's the only reason, right? Uh, but some of the things I have, uh, carrots, yeah, I've gone back and forth on. It depends on the time of year. Uh, most certainly in the middle of winter, and carrots get a little lean on the organic side. I picked up carrots and sliced them up and put them into a dish uh, as a side dish and eaten them on the side. And I can taste a little aftertaste in them. If I get carrots and I put them into like a curry dish of some sort, I really don't get that aftertaste, but so I prefer the organic. So you have to make that decision for yourself, right? We're going to show you in a couple of, in December, we'll start to play with a technique that will start to develop a, an improved relationship between you and the concept of a state change. But uh, we need to be able to do some grounded work, at least for this 
last six months now. Next month will be seven months of being able to appraise and look at and be able to make decisions on what we've learned from our experience with life. Uh, whatever that is for you, it, it's going to be unique for you. Uh, you don't have a problem with all the above. Your biome might not have a problem with it. That's fine. Uh, I don't see this testing that says anything in there about they're looking for toxicities yet or any toxic piece. Same with the dental diet. He's saying eat more animal fat. Uh, most certainly, do I eat grass-fed butter? Yes, because grass-fed butter is gonna give you K1 and K2, right? The hard thing is getting the fat-soluble vitamins in your body. Uh, could I eat the animal fat and get K1 and K2? Yes, I can. But how much of the animal fat is going to have toxins into it. All right, so butter seems to be, yes, I know it comes from cows, dairy cows, but it's different. Dairy cows is a little different than all of a sudden the cows, they fill full of hormones to get them to fatten up a little bit and then slaughter them and provide you with beef. Uh, I'm not sure I want to eat all of the chemicals that wind up in that fat. So I trim that meat and fry it in butter. Maybe I'm crazy, but that's been my experience with it and that's what I do, right? You need to figure out what you're gonna do. Play with all this stuff and see what works for you. If it just gives you some confidence in your mind that you're taking an action in that direction, that's huge. The placebo effect is huge, right? In America, placebo effect is actually greater than most medications are. But we know that all medications are really very toxic for your microbiome. So that's kind of where the pharmaceutical industry leaves us. It's like, leaves us a little challenged. I'm not saying stay away from medication. If you're sick, most certainly see your doctor and get some medication and get well, absolutely without a doubt but there's a consequence for that procedure. So then after you do that, start to treat your gut and start to get back into balance again. And that's the statement we're trying to make. Okay, it's 7.10. I don't have any other questions out there? Not a problem. For those who are, are not on this video, not part of this, uh, email me questions. Most certainly I'd be glad to answer your questions. If you have groups of people in your community that are all on this together and you know each other, contact me and we'll do a, a conference call and answer your questions as a group and interact. All right. So thank you very much. And we'll see you uh, next, next lecture next month. All right. Thanks.